All right, it is the top of the hour, so I'm gonna go ahead and get us all started. So good morning or good afternoon to everyone, depending where you are. Um, today, we're gonna to talk about naloxone distribution, and we are really lucky to have three panelists that are gonna be joining us for this conversation, um, and then a chance for all of you to contribute. So um, welcome, next slide. So just some broader context for you all. Uh, this is a series of webinars that are taking place on the fourth Tuesday of the month at 10 a.m. Pacific time. Um, we've generally been doing kind of a format of there's a panel and then a time for some discussion. And we have several of the next topics picked out. Uh, we're gonna be doing, uh, looking at tailoring interventions for rural communities and then also discussing using learning collaboratives as a dissemination mechanism. But uh, beyond that, we don't have other things planned at this moment. So if there's something that you would really like to hear about from other people around the country, please send us a message so that we can consider that for future sessions. Go ahead and go to the next slide. Um, so today uh, we'll do a few minutes of introductions, then I'm, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Parchman to facilitate our panel discussion. And then we'll uh, break into some smaller groups so that you can have a chance to hear from each other. And then we'll come back and share a highlight from what you've heard from each other. So next slide. So I at this moment would invite you all um, to in the chat, go ahead and put your name um, and your organization, please, just so people can see who all is here. And while you are doing that, I'm going to just briefly introduce our team. So um, my name is Katie Osterhag, and I am lucky enough to work with uh, the team of folks who you see here on the six building blocks program. We have been working with clinics around uh, evidence-based quality improvement related to prescribing of opioids and caring for patients with chronic pain for about the past six years. Um, and so our team is a mix of practice facilitators and um, primary care providers. And a number of us are here with you today. So we're glad to talk to you all and learn from you because this is a this is something that we work with clinics on, but there's always uh, room to learn more. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. And thank you all for putting all of your, your names in the chat. So uh, it's really fun sometimes to see where everybody is coming from. So up uh, at the top, you should have something that says view options. I'm going to ask you to click uh, the annotate option and you can select a stamp or you can use text or kind of an arrow, whatever you want. And I want you to click on the map and tell us where you are joining from today. Okay, this is quite exciting. Really, it looks like all over the country. I'm going to give another 20 seconds, maybe 15. All right. Very, very exciting. Well, we are really glad that you are here with us today. And uh, Sharon, I'm going to let you clear um, the uh, stamps when we move on to the next slide. So I think with that, um, let's go ahead and move to the next slide. Sharon, can you go to the next slide? All right, so with this, I am going to turn it over to uh, Dr. Michael Parchman uh, to take us into our panel discussion. Thanks, Katie, and welcome everybody. We're really excited you're here today for what I think is gonna be um, an exciting conversation um, and discussion. Um, about the topic of uh, naloxone um, uh, distribution. I just want to start by saying that, um, um, you know, I think there have been uh, a number of changes across many states in our country uh, to improve naloxone distribution. And 
And just a few of them, I think, are, are bulleted on this slide. Some of the changes that we've seen, there may not be all these changes in your state, um, but there's uh, been pretty, pretty widespread um, uh, changes in um, uh, improving, you know, traditional prescriptions for naloxone in healthcare settings and um, allowing it to be dispensed without a patient-specific prescription and and making sure that the people at highest risk of overdose are getting naloxone when they leave a treatment setting, um, those kinds of things. And, and, and especially thinking about how to get naloxone um, uh, into the hands of people who need it the most. And that's, that's sort of why we're here today um, is um, to talk about, um, are, there, are there more effective or innovative ways to make sure that naloxone is within reach um, when you need it. Um, and I'm just real excited today to have three presenters or three panel members, not presenters, three discussants um, for our panel today to talk about their experiences with this. Um, and I just wanna say at the front how much we appreciate them um, uh, offering to spend some time with us um, here this morning. So let me uh, go to the next slide and let's let's um, introduce our, our panelists. Uh, next slide. So Susan uh, Kingston um, is with us today. She is at the University of Washington's Addictions, Drug and Alcohol Institute for the past seven years. Um, she has managed multiple community initiatives um, that have had as their central focus harm reduction, um, opioid use disorder treatment, uh, and, and overdose prevention. Um, um, and for the last five years, she's been working on a project to scale up naloxone distribution within the state of Washington. Um, and has designed and led a number of, of peer-led outreach and syringe exchange projects. And we're gonna uh, hear a little bit more from her today about her work. Um, and Renee, we're just so glad you're here today. Uh, Renee Ramirez is the program sponsor for the Lumi Healing Spirit Clinic. Um, the Lumi Healing Spirit Clinic is, is one of the longest running tribally owned and operated um, buprenorphine naloxone distribution programs um, here um, uh, in the Northwest, the Pacific Northwest. Um, it's interesting that it's part of their counseling services and it, it provides um, outpatient treatment um, for patients on opiates and 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 um, it, it's it for me it's interesting because it's really um, because Renee has been immersed in sort of their community campaign uh, thinking about community-based and culturally grounded efforts um, around prevention and, and treatment strategies and so uh, we're just thrilled that that he was able to join us today and finally and not 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 least but but, but, but really appreciate Tim Easterly joining us today from Alaska. Um, Tim has a background in, in security and corrections, um, first in Arizona and now in Alaska for over 20 years, but he's been a major force behind the Alaska initiative called Project Hope um, about ensuring naloxone distribution um, occurs efficiently and effectively you know, throughout um, um, a huge geographic area, um, uh, the state of Alaska. Um, he actually started with this program as a volunteer um, and then became um, an assistant to the program coordinator and, and actually has been uh, with them now for um, the last uh, two and a half to three years doing this work across the state of Alaska. And we're really interested in, in sort of hearing some uh, about what he's been doing there in Alaska. So I just wanna thank all three of you for being here today. Um, we really, really appreciate your your willingness to join us. And and Susan, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with you, um, and ask you. You know, you've you've been leading some statewide efforts about um, a naloxone distribution through a syringe exchange program. And can you tell us or just briefly describe uh, your work in this area? Sure. Are you hearing me okay? Yes, I can hear you fine. Thank okay, you. Great. Nice to be here with you all today. Um, naloxone distribution in Washington State really started with syringe exchange programs. We have a very robust system network of syringe exchange programs in Washington State, and they were really the first ones to start 
community distribution of naloxone. I think the first, first one started in maybe 2012, 2011, 2012, and then, um, because we sort of strengthened some state laws around community distribution and access for naloxone and did some sort of structural work to enable this to happen. Then we did a small pilot with a handful of, of other 10 more syringe exchange programs across the state to see if it was even feasible to do it in particularly more rural syringe exchange areas. And that was so successful that we were able to secure a five-year grant from SAMHSA, the PDO grant, um, to really scale up naloxone distribution statewide. And we made a very conscious decision to structure that around our syringe exchange network. So we basically made each syringe exchange, for lack of a better term, an Amazon fulfillment center for naloxone in their county or in their multi-county region if it was particularly rural. So all of the, most of the naloxone through this grant was being funneled through those syringe exchange programs. Number one, because they had obviously the best access to people who were using opioids and their social and drug using networks. And number two, our strategy was also really to begin to position syringe exchange programs even though they are legal in Washington state, they're not always well understood or popular um, or embraced at a community level. So we felt that by intentionally positioning syringe exchanges as that source of, of something that had high demand in the community, we might be able to change perception um, at a community level about the value of syringe exchange services. So, I would say we're, we're at towards the end of getting close to the end of our five-year grant. And we typically distribute about 12,000, over 12,000 naloxone kits through about 20 to 23 syringe exchange programs across the state. They also distribute, those syringe exchanges are also responsible for training and providing naloxone for law enforcement units in that area who were interested in, in carrying this and in using it in the community. Um, and this, of, of all of the achievements, I think that we can say about how, um, how effective syringe exchanges are at getting out in naloxone, um, we've seen a substantial shift in the relationships between syringe exchange and harm reduction programs and their local law enforcement. Whereas before they were quite antagonist per se and, and didn't really understand each other. And you know, obviously participants in syringe exchange services typically don't have positive experiences with law enforcement. We are now seeing an unprecedented amount of collaboration and even support for syringe exchange programs. There have been a few programs that have gotten a lot of community pushback in the last year. Um, and we've had law enforcement even coming to community meetings to speak in support of syringe exchange programs as a result of this kind of strategy of how we set up distribution. Wow. Wow. So, you know, these syringe exchange programs initially were also responsible for um, providing community training. So if social service organizations, community groups, libraries wanted to access overdose education training and naloxone, representatives from the syringe exchanges could go out and do that training and funnel naloxone to them as well. So that built those other community relationships, friends and family of people who use opioids were encouraged to walk up to their syringe exchange and say, I have a family member and I'd like to get naloxone. We just had in a, our syringe exchange program in Lewis County uh, in Centralia, a rural area, we just had a community member reach out to them for a, they want to give out naloxone at a memorial for a family member who recently died of an overdose and they requested 24 naloxone kits to hand out and we were able to do that. And that's a, that's really game changing in a rural area like that, very conservative, um, where a community member felt 
yeah. you know, comfortable enough to make that request and the, the program was able to fulfill that request. So you're really changing the conversation in the community is what, you know, what you're really trying to do here. Is that right? Yeah, yep. And I don't want to oversell how much change we've made. There's still plenty of, oh, sure. you know, What's plenty that? of resistance and misunderstanding in our communities. But, but I really have um, been excited about how we've been able to leverage this network of providers and, um, and how deep into the communities they can really get. So do you have standard training for your work, your workforce in the syringe exchange program in, in, in doing this kind of public speaking and communicating with the public? How do you do that? Well, initially in the grant, we created a, a master trainer program. And so we, um, we trained up a number of key trainers regionally um, who went through a, a, a full day training on it. And then they've been able to then train the trainer and we have materials, all of our training materials are on our website, stopoverdose.org. So messaging and education, flyers, inserts for kits, all of those materials we just made available so that anybody in the community who wants to take on this activity, we've got resources for them. That's great. Thanks. And I just want to make a plug for your website. I think the stopoverdose.org website, I've, I've referred um, I can't count how many times I've talked to people and referred them to the resources on your website. And I see Sharon is putting it into the chat. So those of you who want to check out the website. Um, Thank you. So that's great. Um, do, you get, do you engage any primary care kind of clinic settings with your program or how does that work? You know, early on, we certainly did. Um, but our, our primary focus was really on places that could not access, that didn't have any way to bill for naloxone, mm -hmm. right? So in primary care settings, there was a, a, a mechanism for prescribing naloxone yeah. and having that paid for. So it was less of a, less of a gap <laughs> yeah. for us. Um, but we've certainly provided a lot of training and we've done a lot of work, especially early on in our um, grant with pharmacies to increase the capacity of pharmacies um, yeah. to be able to mm -hmm. initially prescribe naloxone themselves for pharmacists to do that um, and then set up partnerships with community-based pharmacies and social service agencies like drug treatment programs who wanted to provide naloxone, how to partner with your local pharmacy to be able to get kits um, yeah. and bill Medicaid or other insurances for those kits. So we've done a lot of technical assistance work on that end as well. Wow, that's fantastic. That's just amazing. Um, <laughs> I just, I'm, I'm just always um, amazed um, at the work that you do every time I go visit your website and read about uh, your projects. Um, so thank you, really thank appreciate you. you your participating um, today. So um, Renee, I, I'm gonna turn to you next. Um, I, I understand that, that the illumination has spearheaded this kind of community um, campaign to address the opioid public health crisis um, um, in, in, in your nation and in your community. Can you just share a brief description of that community-based campaign, including and maybe just say a word about the, we heard something about a door-to-door -door distribution, something like that. Can you, can you provide us with sort of, sort of an overview? Yeah, sure. So I'll kind of give you a history so you understand how we got to where we're at. Yeah, tell us the story. And I didn't realize, I thought this was just going to be local people, so I didn't realize everybody from the states here was going to join from different areas. So it'd be good for them to understand just tribal nations, I guess, a little bit. So let me, uh, we're big, but it's, kind of, it's small also. Uh, we're 5,000 plus members, and uh, it's even though it's 5,000 people, it's still a close-knit community. And so when decisions are made by tribal council, they really listen to the general council and general councils, the community members of the tribe. And so they really drive a lot of the efforts that have been ongoing. And so if you go back to 2011, 2012, that's when um, Lummi Nation decided to have the police officers carrying naloxone. And the medical director here told me that it was actually the first police department in the West Coast to carry naloxone. So you really see how it spearheads things. And so, you know, the police and paramedics, I think the paramedics came a little bit after that, but you see again, the community coming together 
to to have that as another tool for life saving um, of community members until you really see the love and care that the the council and the community have for one another. And so when you jump forward to 2019, uh, we received various grants, also funding. Uh, before we received the grants, the tribe would spend more than $50,000 on naloxone from like 2011 to 2018. Um, and so one of the things we we always heard was outreach. You know, what are you doing? Because we're a treatment center. And so sometimes you have your treatment center focus and you don't really think about outreach or you know how do you reach people that aren't coming through? You just you have such a huge workload as is. But again, we're tribal, and so we have to listen to the community. So they're saying, "What are you doing for outreach?" So then you know we apply for grants and various funding sources. But the the idea has already been sent of you know we have to use naloxone, we have to get it out into the community. So before the door to door, door distribution we would train the HR department, the safety officer. So they would do naloxone training as part of first aid and CPR. Um, NWIC is a Northwest Indian College. So the security officers and staff, we would distribute naloxone to them to have it out in the community. Um, and then community members knew to come to the Healing Spirit Clinic, our opiate treatment program, no questions asked if they needed naloxone. Um, and we're talking about naloxone and so um, that's when you talk about it here in the beginning before Narcan, it was always injectable um, naloxone with an atomizer to spray. So there was two, the needles and the, the spray. Um, and then when Narcan came along, that made it a lot easier and it really increased how many people came because there was less of a fear to use it. Um, and then with the outreach, we have recovery coaches that visit the high risk houses. So people know each other, so they know which people are still suffering through their addiction and they know who's at risk. So the recovery coaches, um, there might be different names across the country. Peer support services is what they fall under. Um, so they do outreach to those high risk homes and provide naloxone for them. And so then the, when it came to the door to door, LUMI, um, not through the Healing Spirit Clinic, but through the mental health, uh, department. They went to White Mountain Apache, I believe, and they saw a program in regards to suicide prevention. And so they really liked it. And when they came back, they said, how can we do this? And so that's where the door to door campaign came across. And there was somebody, I think an elder brought up the idea of, you know, do you think people that are using drugs, they're slowly killing themselves? And do you think they have suicide, suicidal ideation? And so there was that thought of like, you know, how can we help them if that's something that's going on. And so because of the history with naloxone distribution, they knew, well, let's add a naloxone kit into the package. And so they went around door to door. So it was more for suicide ideation because we had a recent loss, but because it's in the tribal community here, it's not really just about treating the addiction, but it's about treating the whole person. So the physical, the mental, the spiritual, because there's a lot of things you lose in regards to culture. And then and the biggest one is just going to their houses to say, hey, we're here for you. Here's some resources. If you need somebody to talk to, you know, we love you, we're here for you. And so that's kind of the cultural component that encompasses uh, that, encompass that particular program. So it was really um, spearheaded by mental health, the mental health department, but because of the history of just having the locks on available to the community, we distributed it that one. So, I, so the messaging, as I hear from from the, the, both the tribal council and, and the mental health program, um, is really around um, you're a part of us, um, you're a part of our our family. We love you. Um, is is there more cultural tailoring to the messaging that goes on in, in that campaign that that you think resonates with with tribal members? I think that part, we have it easy because as an, so I'm an outsider. So some of us as outsiders, we have all this information and we just go to, for example, my program director here, she's a tribal elder. And so elders are extremely respected here in the community and mm -hmm. tribal council. So we have the information and we go to them oh. and say, this is what we have. How would you like to present it? And so they help us tailor it 
yeah. to the needs. And, yeah. you know, a lot of times you don't really understand certain things sure. because you're not culture and they help you. They guide you through that, that piece. That's fantastic. What a, what a, what an amazing resource you have um, there. That's, that's great. Thank you, Renee. And thank you for telling us the, the story. Um, that's really great. So Tim, can I turn to you next? Um, um, and Tim, thank you for joining us. I just want to say um, how thrilled we are that you're able to, to, to join us uh, today um, from Alaska. Can you tell us a little bit about the program in Alaska for naloxone distribution, kind of a, an overview? Yeah. Um, so first I want to say thank you for having me. And uh, I see that the, the other panelists have some great experience um, and those are great stories. Uh, here in Alaska, we basically, anybody that wants to be a, what we call them ORPs, uh, an overdose response program, um, can uh, apply. In the, in the beginning, it was a lot of cold calling. Uh, the, the guys who started Project Hope, uh, they sat down and they brainstormed who they wanted to have involved. Um, and then they just called them and asked them if they'd like to be involved. Um, I think one of their biggest coups was getting the state level public health nursing involved because they are geographically located all over the state in rural communities. Um, there's a clinic, public health clinics all over the place um, and they got major buy-in from them. And so they were spreading the word and getting other people in it. There's a lot of, uh, in 2016, when the governor just uh, uh, declared a state of emergency, um, it was recognized and there's a, there's a definite um, interest in all of our communities in supporting program, a program like this. Yeah. Um, so basically we train anybody who's interested uh, in how to be an ORP, um, how to do the, the paperwork administration and they become hubs. And so we ship them the, the kits and then they, do, they deal with the distribution uh, either to other uh, distributors or directly to the public. We've got um, right now a little over a hundred uh, of our keys. Um, uh, Project Hope is housed in uh, the Office of Substance Misuse and Addiction Prevention. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're, we're fairly small and, and, but everybody pitches in and um, we push Project Hope at all of our webinars at all of the uh, uh, coalition meetings. We have strong relationships with our coalitions here in, in, in Alaska, all over the state. Um, they do a lot of uh, referrals, uh, you know, new organizations a lot of times come through our coalition uh, partners. Um, I, one thing that I'm kind of excited about right now is, um, I don't know if you've heard of Rhode Island and Erie County, New York's and Lox boxes. Um, they're yeah. wall-mounted public access um, Narcan kits, basically. They, they have doses of Narcan instructions, um, other small things like gloves and face shields, um, but they're placed in public locations where anybody can get to them in the case of an overdose in a public space. Um, and we've decided to, to model all, oh, after that program, we've, we've purchased our boxes. Um, I'm currently working on a proposal to come down from the state to all public facing state buildings have one, similar to an AED deployment model. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's something that we're, we're working on right now. Uh, we currently distribute roughly 9,000 kits a year. Um, we'd like to increase that. Um, we were working off the PDO grant, um, which is about to end, I think, uh, September of this year. Um, but we applied for it again. Um, and we, are also re we also received funding from the SOAR grant um, the state state's opioid response. Um, so can I, ask, can I ask you a question about so once an organization applies to be an ORP or an mm -hmm. opioid response program, mm -hmm. um, um, so they they submit the application and and you guys process it and <clears throat> and and then they become one of the hubs, the ORP hubs in your state. Um, you said something about some training they go through. But then is there ongoing yeah. support? And what does that support look like? Well, um, we tend to supply them the kits. We, we rely heavily on volunteers. Um, and they, again, they usually come from our partners uh, in either the coalitions or the ORPs themselves to, to 
put the kits together from the raw materials. We order all the materials, get them shipped in, and then we have uh, we host build outs where people get together, a group gets together, and they put together a bunch of kits. <clears throat> so when a, an RP uh, makes their initial request or requests later on for more kits, we do that. We we handle that. We ship a, ship out to them. We, we everything comes through through us in the state office, and then we ship them out to all of our partners. Also, whenever we're doing anything <clears throat> like um, that they might be interested in, because OSMAP handles a lot of things like um, the provider echoes where they talk, they're talking about mm -hmm. um, prescription practices. Mm -hmm. um, we deal with pharmacies. Um, any information that our team is working on, we share with all of our partners. Um, so do any you have questions? webinars? Do you have, I'm sorry to interrupt. Do you have webinars for them that are kind of ongoing updates or trainings, or how do you do that? <clears throat> Not specific, but we, we do try to let them know that if there's anything coming up that their organization might be interested in. Um, okay. Anytime. Uh, we are working on a more consistent communication with our partners. Right now, it's kind of one way they, they request anything that they request, we try to help them out with um, yeah. as much as we can. Yeah. Uh, even if it's outside the scope of this, the kids themselves. Um, sure. But other than that, yeah, uh, it's pretty much, we're working on a lot of different initiatives to yeah, try Yeah, you got a lot of balls the, in the air. It's the yeah, to build about, those yeah. relationships. Yeah, yeah, I'm really intrigued by the Nalox box idea. That's really, that's really. Yeah, we're really excited about it. Um, and a lot of it has to do with, the, as the lady was talking about, uh, Susan, conversation yeah getting getting the community talking about it um put it out there and, and starting that conversation to maybe deal with some stigma um and get it get it get the ball rolling yeah yeah it's all about trusted part trusting relationships and partnerships and conversations absolutely well thank you tim really appreciate you joining us here today that was fantastic um what you shared with us that's that's really great so i'm gonna Toss the ball back, I think, at this point to, um, um, is it Sharon? I think Brooke is going to take it from here. Oh, Brooke, OK. And thank you. For, Before we did that, call. did we want to check in if, if there were any questions that folks had for the panelists? Do we have time for that, or are we running short on time? I think we have a few minutes. Yeah. Any questions for the for the just plop plop your questions into the chat. I'll go back and see if there are any questions in the chat. Give people just a few seconds to put a question in the chat for the panelists. There was one question about the six building blocks and the lock zone and how we have incorporated that. Uh, yeah. So you might want to take that, Michael. Yeah, so so we've incorporated really just naloxone into the primary care setting about prescribing naloxone for high risk patients and and just having the clinic think about who's who's at risk um, and and making sure as part of their workflows and processes um, that they make sure that patients um, at risk have uh, naloxone, but also using that naloxone prescription as an opportunity to have a conversation with both the patient and members of their household um, about their risk and why they're getting naloxone. Because it doesn't do any good to give the patient the naloxone. Um, it's the, it's the, their, their household member who needs to be trained in the use of it, obviously. Um, and so that's been, I think, a really interesting conversation for many of our primary care clinics to think about how to use naloxone prescribing as a way to have, and again, a conversation with both the patient and their family members about the risks associated with opioid use um, in, the, in, a, in a primary care setting. Um, there's a question about how you're handling um, data collection about naloxone distribution. Are there any good centralized platforms that uh, are easy for partners to use to, to report, um, or are you even trying to collect that sort of data? Any of the panelists want to talk about data collection? 
Yeah, I can say that we developed a, a really simple survey monkey survey and we created one for the syringe exchanges and naloxone going out for lay responders, both um, a, a quick data collection tool for anybody who's getting their first kit. And then mm -hmm. when folks come back for a refill, we ask them why they're getting their refill. And if it was used in an overdose, we also collect some information about the overdose event that happened. And then we have a similar setup for law enforcement. When we initially train officers, we collect some baseline data. And then when they use naloxone in the field, they go into a database and enter that information as well. So you so can, can survey monkey as detailed and as simple as you want. Yeah, so they can just go in and, and plop in their responses to the survey monkey and that's how they enter their data. That's yep. great. That's cool. Yeah. Okay. We um, just do a simple I, Excel spreadsheet and it's based on the invoices because um, since we don't have a don't ask questions, you know, we're just happy that you're here to get the naloxone. Right. The, with some of the grants, you have to be careful which with which grant you use. If the grant is data hungry, <laughs> like they want a lot of data, we won't use it because like I said, the tribe's willing to pay more than 50,000 per year just to get it out in the community. So more about just treating people and helping them instead of generating data. But with one of the, it's uh, similar to the SOAR grant, it's an Indian Nation Agreement grant. They're not, they understand the tribal sovereignty and just not wanting to get like information out there. The tribe doesn't right. and share a lot of information in regards to demographics. And so um, we're, we're careful with which grants we use. So if there's ones where we don't have to age, that's the easiest one to use for funding. And so we just keep a, a total tally from the invoices in the spreadsheet by quarter. Mm -hmm. quarter to them. Tim, were you gonna respond? Yeah, I was going to say that we do the same, very similar to uh, what Renee's doing. We have a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that we track our distributions. Every kit that goes out gets entered into that. Um, we have pre-training and post-training surveys that are they're totally um, uh, voluntary. We also have a report back form that everybody's informed of. You know, if you use it, please complete the report back form. We're also adding to, we're going to add to our kits a, we recently partnered with one of our, uh, uh, the state's tribal health consortiums to uh, get keychains added to our kits that have a, uh, a text, you know, a please text rescue to 97779 after you use this kit um, huh. that has the same uh, questions as of the report back form, but it's just a, a better way, uh, easier way for people to get that information back to us. So you, can you repeat that last point? You have a keychain in the We're kit. We're gonna add it and, and it's gonna be printed with the, uh, the text. Uh, it's gonna say, please text rescue to 97779 after use. Huh. And it'll have the same, they'll be prompted by text with the same questions that are on our yeah. uh, report back uh, form. Huh, fascinating. What an innovative idea. That's great. Um, that's with um, Commons, I think it's, I can't remember the full name, it's uh, Public Commons maybe? It's a okay. texting, yeah, it's a texting okay. platform. Okay. And I'm sorry, and the platform for the text option is what? Commons? Yeah, uh, public, public commons, I think. I'm not 100% sure. Um, we deal with our partner and they deal with the actual service provider. Yeah, okay. Great, well, again, thank you to the, to the panel, um, panel members today. I just can't tell you how much all of us appreciate you taking your time to to, to share your stories and your experiences um, with the rest of us. This has just been a fascinating conversation. So, um, uh, Brooke. Great. Uh, so we are now moving to a small group discussions. So Sharon, if you go to the next slide, we can talk a little bit about what we're hoping. Um, really, this is a chance for you all to have a productive conversation with others who are engaged in this work or others who aren't and just have questions to be able to 
um, generate ideas that you can bring back to your state that can help you with the work that you're doing. And one thing that we as a six building blocks team will be doing is compiling all of these key learnings that we hear in these small group discussions and also through the panel that we'll share after the webinar with all of you. Um, on the next slide, you'll see what the questions are, um, which your facilitator and your small group will also lead you through. But we really wanna talk a little bit about if you have a program that distributes naloxone, what have you found has been really successful that might be useful for others in your group to know about? Or what challenges do you face that maybe you have questions for others who are in your group? Um, and since we are in the middle of a pandemic, what are the adaptations that you've made that have been helpful with naloxone distribution? Um, if your program doesn't distribute naloxone, we welcome any questions that you have for those who do. Um, and if there's anything that you heard in the panelist discussion that you think you might be bringing back to your state, we'd love to hear about that as well. Um, when you get in, you can list your name and organization in the chat. Um, and keep in mind that when you come back to share, everyone is going to be asked to um, put in the chat something that they thought was really interesting that they learned during their discussion. All right, welcome back, everybody. Looks like people are still rolling in. Um, we have three minutes left, and so this is time crunch, but I would like to invite everybody to take 30 seconds to go ahead and put in the chat something that you learned today or heard that was an interesting idea that you might be interested in taking back to your organization. Go ahead and take a few seconds and type that in there. Vending machines, mailing, the locks box, stigma reduction campaigns, partnering with syringe exchange programs, text messaging, uh, partnering with uh, uh, incarceration, Okay, great. Really, I totally agree. I, I also uh, learned some new things from listening to you all today. Uh, I am going to invite you to continue typing those in there so you can see from each other. Um, Sharon, if you can go ahead and take us to the next slide. So uh, we would really appreciate, Sharon's going to put in the chat a link that is to a two question um, survey. This is going to help us uh, improve our programming so that it is most beneficial to you. So we'd appreciate if you would take probably about two minutes and just respond to those two questions for us. And um, in terms of just a reminder, so our, our next webinar is going to be at the end of May on the 25th, um, so 10 a.m. Pacific. And we are talking about uh, programs that are specific to rural communities. So we would uh, invite you to join us there. And I know Sharon will be following up with links regarding where to register. All right, and let's see, I think, if you, Sharon, if you can go to the next slide. All right, here is our contact information. If there's anybody that wants to, um, if, if in hearing others talk today, if there are resources that your organization is using or a website, or I heard a couple people talk about stigma related campaigns, this is a great opportunity for us to share from and learn each other from each other. So please um, feel free to send an email. Um, probably best to send it to Sharon um, uh, down there on the bottom right. And that way we can consider uh, incorporating those resources in the one pager that we develop for you all uh, after today. So that formally takes us to the top of the hour. I, again, thank you very much for joining us and also for not just listening, but sharing with each other. It's, I think it's really, really valuable for us to do that. So sincerely, thank you. And thanks to the panelists. Indeed. All right, hope you all have a great rest of your days. Bye, everybody.